Hello, I'm Jaya Chakraborty from the Department of Mass Communication and Journalism, Tejpur University. Popular participation or people's participation entered the international development discourse since 1960s. Participation gained prominence in the 1990s to become the buzzword that legitimizes all development interventions globally. Similar to the discipline of development communication, which has been an evolutionary perspective, the idea of participation has also been defined differently by various scholars, in both cases leading to further enrichment of their understanding. In this module, we will attempt to understand the historical evolution, purpose, process and the outcomes of participation. This module will equip communication practitioners as well as educators to work with participation in solving current development problems and also help researchers to use participatory framework in empirical research. The concept of development began to change in the 1970s. There was a paradigmatic shift from the earlier technologically deterministic and GNP-centered definitions to alternative conceptions of development, which were more qualitative. Questions were raised regarding the mass media-centric information transmissional approach of the Western development model. Such models which focused on economic growth and overlooked issues of sustainability and lacked concern for social, cultural and environmental consequences were widely critiqued by scholars in Asia, Africa and Latin America. Following such criticism, the definition of development broadened to include freedom from inequality and unjust class structure and protection of cultural and natural heritage. During this period, the counter discourse on communication also looked at it as a widely people driven process of self assertion, communicative social action, deconstruction of dominant ideology and power relationships. It asserted for strengthening of critical consciousness among the communities. Communication for social change was thus defined as a process of public and private dialogue through which people themselves define who they are, what they need and how to get what they need in order to improve their lives and assert their identities as meaningful contributors to the society. It utilizes dialogue that leads to collective problem identification, decision making and community based implementation of solutions to development issues. Public participation was thereby understood to be integral to the process of social change. Participation herein is essentially about redistribution of power and realigning structural inequalities. It enables those citizens presently marginalized and excluded from economic and political processes to be deliberately included in determining how information is shared, goals and policies are set, programs are implemented and benefits are universally shared. Consequently, the corresponding communication strategy also changed focus to emphasize on process and context. Within the participatory model, communication is receiver centric and the attention is on meanings sought and ascribed rather than on information transmission. While generally agreeing that participation is essentially about fostering inclusion, democratization and dialogue, most scholars on participatory communication have differentiated between two approaches to participation. Jan Sarvis and Malik Hau discuss about the dialogical pedagogy of Paulo Freire and the access, participation and self-management idea of UNESCO. Melkote and others outline the participation as a means approach and 
participation as an ends approach. Thomas Tufte and Paolo Maslopoulos distinguish between a social movement perspective and a project based or institutional perspective of participation. All these approaches to participation in spite of being rooted in the same philosophical doctrine outline certain distinctions which help us to better understand the purpose and the context of application of the participatory framework. We will now take a look at each one of these approaches to participatory communication one by one. One of the earlier and most noteworthy scholars who applied the ideas of liberation theology to communication practices in development was Paulo Freire. In his seminal work, Pedagogy of the Oppressed, Freire argued that subjugated people should be treated as fully human, who are free from all forms of internal and external oppression. He calls for a dialogic process of liberation that leads to expanded consciousness and power. Freire assumed that genuine dialogue frees people and communities to determine their own future. He called this radical outcome as conscientization, which means learning to perceive social, political and economic contradictions and to take action against the oppressive elements of reality. Freire's idea of participatory communication thus laid more emphasis on the intentions of communicative action rather than on the forms and languages of communication. The UNESCO discourse on the other hand which talked about participatory communication looked at it as a progressive model of participation whereby the first stage of access means the use of media for public service. At this stage the public have the opportunity to choose from relevant communication content and can give feedback to transmit their reactions and demands to the production organization. In the second level of participation, the public have involvement in the production process, planning and management of the communication system. Such involvement may be limited to representation or consultation in decision making. A more advanced level of participation is self-management. In this case, the public exercises the power of decision making and is involved in formulation of plans and policies with regard to communication enterprises. The UNESCO approach is distinct from the argument of Freire in that it allows for gradual progression from access to self-management whereby the final stage may be delayed based on the preparedness of the community. Freire, however, does not provide any such scope of compromise in terms of gradual participation. He believes that there is either full participation or no participation. One either respects the culture of the other or falls back into the dominant banking mode of education. Another difference between the two approaches is that Freire talks in terms of the oppressed whereas UNESCO mentions in neutral terms about the public and refers to self-management of institutions by those participating in it. Participation as a means approach is operationally situated within the dominant paradigm though its roots are credited in discourses that are critical of it. On the face of the rising Latin American criticism of the dominant paradigm in the 1970s, various proponent scholars of the Western modernization approach acknowledged its limitations. They expanded their research to include interpersonal networks of participation in order to make the dominant paradigm more expansive, flexible and humane. However, they still dispelled all local knowledge and cultural beliefs as inconsistent with the reality of globalization. Participation was thus being used to enhance the status of traditional development practices and as a means to redeem the dominant paradigm from all interrogation. 
Such use of participatory communication was essentially a manipulative consultation done only to help advance a predetermined objective. Conversely, participation as an end approach maintained that participation must be recognized as a basic human right and that it should be accepted and supported as an end in itself and not just for its use to achieve other kinds of result. The rise of the neoliberal development discourse and the community development programs in the 1980s added to a new dimension to the understanding of participatory communication. It was being seen as an instrument of fostering bottom-up process of self-determination through localized self-help groups in times of shrinking states. Participation was seen as an instrument to make community-based projects more efficient and effective. It was not about contesting structural violence or pursuing social transformation, but focused on service delivery in the most efficient manner. The alternative ideology contests that pragmatism and instrumentality inherent in the perception of participatory communication has to be replaced by an ideological stance. A shift is required towards radical participation, which is a normative stand calling for a bottom-up perspective in pursuit of social justice and human rights in pro-poor communication. In an environment of genuine participation, all development stakeholders would employ participatory communication to author development from below, restructure power relations and enhance public sector accountability by including participation in policy processes. Thus, the discourse on the practice of participatory communication have evolved substantially over time. Newer perspectives have also been incorporated with the turn of the century. The advancements in new media have led to policy-oriented processes in participation, rise in civil society-driven advocacy, social movements and media activism. Also, a more transformative role of participation is envisaged in the new millennium through improved efficiency in service delivery, participatory democracy, and participatory governance of political projects. To understand the process of participation better, we will now focus on some important models of participation. The first among them is the Ladders of Participation by Sherry A. Einstein. One of the classic texts in research on participation is A Ladder of Citizen Participation by Sherry Einstein, where she advocates for citizen power. Einstein's ladder helps to understand the different types and degrees to which a participatory framework is created within any scheme of operations. She situates a model within the assumption that participation is about realigning power dynamics in social structures. According to her, participation cannot happen without redistribution of decision-making power. The latter has eight rungs representing eight types of participation with each rung corresponding to the extent of citizens' power in determining the end product. Starting from the lowest rung, the degrees of participation can be categorized as non-participation, that is when the citizen are passive. Uh, next as tokenism, where the citizen are partially responsive. And lastly, the citizen power, where they are actively engaged in the process. The bottom rungs are manipulation and therapy, which are both non-participative. Here the purpose is to just cure or educate the passive participants we are understood to have no knowledge or capacity. The idea is to just create an environment of acceptance and agreement among the public through strategies of public relations. This is the type of participation that we are most familiar with. Here, there is no active role designated for the public. The rungs three and four, information and consultation, correspond to tokenism where the have-nots are allowed to hear or have a voice. 
but they lack the power to ensure that their views will be heeded by the powerful. Informing is understood to be the crucial first step of participation. However, in most cases it is limited to one-way top-down flow of communication from those in control of the process to the intended beneficiaries. Consultation is usually done by organizations who feel obligated to the community. It is usually done through meetings or surveys which facilitate some dialogue. The community feels involved in the process but the decision making power is still retained by the external agency or organization. The rung 5 placation is a higher degree of tokenism and falls short of the true spirit of participation. Here usually a small group of representatives from the community are handpicked to participate. It is seen to be safe to engage with this small group of people. The decision making power is still retained by the power holders as it is they who ultimately decide about the legitimacy and appropriateness of the suggestions put forth by the community representatives. In the rung of partnership, citizens are enabled to negotiate and engage in trade-offs with traditional power holders. Power is redistributed to community members and they are now involved in decision-making committees. There are specific roles and responsibilities identified for them. However, there is still the risk of excluding some stakeholders like the youth or women. In the delegation rung, active involvement of the community is ensured and majority of the decisions are now taken by them. They are accountable for the process and are involved in important decisions like budget and financial implications, etc. At the final stage of delegated power and citizen control, have not obtained the majority of decision making seats or full managerial power. The community takes full control of the process and are now responsible to govern all aspects of its delivery and management. The process is now self-managed by the community and they are the sole power holders. Einstein's typology of participation thus provides a clear framework to understand gradual progression from non-participation to full participation, a process whereby nobodies in several arenas are trying to become somebodies with enough power to make the target institutions responsive to their views, aspirations and needs. She however cautions against the generalization of the idea of powerless citizens and the powerful as in actuality none of them are homogeneous blocks but may comprise host of divergent points of view, significant cleavages, competing vested interests and splintered subgroups. Further. On both sides of the fence, there might be other resistances to our participation not accounted for in the model, like racism, distrust, poor socio-economic infrastructure, inability to form citizens' groups, and similar other constraints. The next model that we are going to talk about is Nair and White's participation matrix. In a project mode, participation is about aligning the priorities of the external facilitating agency, in this case representing the power holders, with that of the community, in this case representing the powerless. Communication at a co-equal level in such cases facilitates knowledge sharing and promotes a democratic forum respectful of the local knowledge and the right to communication of all people. Nair and White proposed a transactional communication model to complement this idea of co-equal knowledge sharing. The typology metrics developed by Nair and White describes three levels of participation, high, quasi and low from the perspective of the receiver. The model outlines the nine role typologies for the interaction between the source and the receiver. The nature of participation is described by the individual cells in the matrix. 
In this matrix, cell 1 represents the ideal type of communication where there is high involvement on the part of both the target group as well as the development communicator. In this type, the source and receiver are in continuous contact and working as equal partners in the development effort, making decision regarding implementation and jointly assessing the outcomes of the process. This however remains a more utopian condition, difficult to achieve in reality due to the unequal power structures and inequitable distribution of resources. Nyron White rather put forth the transactional typology of cell 5 to be a situation best suited for knowledge sharing on a co-equal basis between the source and receiver as it is more realistic and achievable. The cell 9 represents a haphazard mode of communication which means that there is no outlined participation or communication between the source and the receiver. Such sort of a communication is obviously destined to fail. The third model that we are going to discuss today is the White's typology of participation. Sarah White further points to the politics of participation whereby the language of democracy dominates the development circle, but sharing through participation does not necessarily lead to sharing of power. The important question that she raises are about who participates and at what level. She identifies the diversity of form, function and interest that get entwined with the process of participation. White identifies the competing motivations for different players or actors, their conflicting ideological perspectives that may come into play during any initiative. The model distinguishes four types of participation and the characteristics of each. She identifies nominal, instrumental, representative and transformative participation. In the tabular model, the first column shows the form of participation. The second shows the interest in participation from the top-down perspective, indicating the interest that the program designers and developers have in the participation of others. Conversely, the third column indicates the bottom-up perspective of the interest and expectations of the participants from the process. The final column characterizes the overall function of each type of participation. White graphically illustrates the potential of conflict in all narratives of participation whereby those with power as well as those without interface with each other's self-interest enthusiasm and anticipation of results. The terms of engagement are critical as discrete expectations of maintaining domination encounters the anticipation of exchanging control of power relations. White's model thus provides an entry point to the critical discourses on participatory communication where one needs to go beyond the obvious to explore the often invisible and discrete interplays, conflicts and motivations of parties involved in the process. With the turn of the millennium and the proliferation of new media technologies, the traditional roles of communication have been redefined with the demarcations between public, private and mass getting increasingly blurred and congruent. Mediatization of communication and its role in propelling social movements are a phenomenon that we all have to reckon with. We have to also understand the role of technology as a new vector which opens up newer connections between information, communication, knowledge production and sharing. 
In a networked society, the benefits of globalization are to be weighed against the black holes of information capitalism for those who still remain disconnected. It is in this context that Tufte puts forth his proposition of cultures of governance as an epistemological approach in communication for social change. He identifies it as a process of empowerment which enables people to control the direction of their life trajectory. Borrowing from Gonzalez's proposition of cyber culture, he seeks to confront and challenge the process of isolation, ignorance and inability to develop local and situated knowledge. Isolation of communities in this context is seen as the preeminent representation of information capitalism which keeps them marginalized and holds them back from claiming the rights and making their voices heard. Isolation of communities in this context is seen as the preeminent representation of information capitalism which keeps them marginalized and holds them back from claiming their rights and making their voices heard. Newer understanding and research in participatory communication has to be situated in this continuum. With this, we come to the end of today's lecture. In our subsequent lectures, we will discuss about other aspects of communication from social change and we would also try to understand how the different approaches to communication and social change are structured and how they are connected with each other. Thank you for today.